Good morning, Crossbridge. I'm Mason Klein. And I'm Jackson Posey, and we're seniors, uh, we're seniors in high school, and uh, we're so happy to have taken Morgan and Dan's jobs for this week so that we can give you direct address here on Sunday morning. Well, today's Student Ministry Sunday. We're so excited about what God has done this summer in Ablaze. Coming up on September 8th, we're going to have Paint Wars at Ablaze. And if you thought the Franco-Prussian War was fascinating to dissect, man, there's so many strategies that kids use. All of them are going to come home covered in rainbows of paint. Bring a towel, a change of clothes, but most importantly, bring all your friends. Well, this Sunday, our pastor and older brother in Christ, Christopher Andrew Dillashaw, will be bringing us the word about Matthew 5, about how we're the city on a hill. Yeah, Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's lean into what God has for us this morning. Good morning. We are excited to worship Jesus. How about you? Come on, how about you? All right, we need you guys to sing loud today. Let's stand up together and worship. Sing us to be wandering. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. And I try with all of my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond just went. And just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. You picked me up, turned me around, and placed my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior. And I've got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends, burning in bitterness, you can just keep it moving. No, you ain't welcome here, no, 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 no. And just when I Cause you picked me up 
thank you, Jesus, for freedom, for new life. Bless your name. The God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. This I know, that my God will never fail. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the
Amen. Jesus, we proclaim that you take what is the enemy means for, means for evil and you turn it for good. You're the only one who does that. Lord, we're not going to, the Bible says that we don't trust in chariots. We don't trust in horses. We trust in the Lord our God. Father, whatever the modern day equivalent is of chariots and horses, we're saying no to it. We're saying you alone have the authority, the power to meet our need, God. Lord, only you can speak into the, to the deep place. Speak into the deep place, God. We need that. We need that. You told us not to fear because you were with us. You told us not to be dismayed because you would be our God. You said you would strengthen us. You will help us. You will uphold us with your righteous right hand. Oh, God, the peace. so many people need that. In Afghanistan, in Haiti, in the southern border, Lord, people stuck there. They need to see your righteous right hand. So, Lord, we speak your authority. We speak the name of Jesus in all those situations. Because you're the answer. Lord, include us. Include us in the answer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, good morning to you guys. I'm Kirk Freeman, and I'm the lead pastor at Crossbridge. We got lots of them here. And uh, hey, you know, every week we put this screen up on this uh, on the slide that shows uh, what we're all about. Um, and I want to tell you how it applies in a really practical way right now. I know you're all aware of what's going on in Afghanistan, uh, the devastation from the in Haiti from the earthquake. Many of those people were living still in tents from 11 years ago, and they've been hit again. And then our southern border, the human trafficking crisis is, is just crazy right now. A lot's going on. There are food shortages, unrelated to all of that, food shortages in uh, Uganda, parts of Indonesia, as countries try to shut down COVID inadvertently created a food shortage. And people, we have ministry partners in all of these countries that we're talking about who tell us that people are literally starving. So let me tell you what we do. You know, when it comes to loving others and it comes to uh, going and making disciples of all nations, there's kind of three big things that we do as a church. We pray, we give, and we go. So this week, Wednesday through Thursday, Wednesday through Friday, if you read the emails or you were following us on social media, I invited you to join me in a three-day period of fasting and prayer for the situation I've just described. Because we're going to be a people that prayed. We offered three opportunities for you to come via Zoom or in person to pray with us and intercede for the nations I've just discussed. As And, and going as part of the... Uh, Antioch, we're, well, we're part of a group of 93 churches worldwide called the Antioch Movement of Churches. Together we send a team all, uh, that leaves today uh, to go to Haiti for the, an advanced team of doctors and logistical folks who are going to assess the need and how our network of churches can be a part of making a difference in being the hands and feet of Jesus. They're going to come back and then I'm going to come to you and say, hey guys, here's what we need. Can you go to Haiti? So if I want you to be thinking about that right now. And I don't know all the needs. Certainly there's always a need for medical personnel. But there could be others. So I want you to be ready for that. Because we're going to be on the front lines. See, if it's on the headlines of, of the news, then it's on the heart of God. Okay? But let me also tell you how we're going to give. Pray, give, go. Here's how we're going to give. Every penny that comes in today, we're just going to give it straight away. By Wednesday afternoon, every dollar that comes in is going to either go to through reliable ministry partners that we've worked with and have vetted is going to go to one of the nations that I've mentioned and we're just going to be we're just going to immediately get aid and food to people. So I'm going to put on the screen a way that you can be a part of the giving. You know, we're going to trust God with the utility bill and the salaries and and all that stuff that normally has to be paid for. He'll take care of that here. What we're going to do as the wealthiest nation on the planet we're going we're gonna to give. We're going to give. 
You can use the website, our app. There is a wooden box right as you leave the doors, right as you leave between the two front doors there. You can just put an old-fashioned check or green spending dollars in there. Whatever it is, it's all going to go out the door, and it's going to go out fast because people need help now. We want to be a people who pray and give and go. And when we are, it's not like we're giving away our time or even giving away our money. God said there is not a thing that we give for the sake of His purposes that He doesn't then reward. And he, He's just a generous God. And He's inviting us in this time to be part of, to include us in the miracle of how He's going to meet people's needs. Let's be part of that. Let's pray together. And then after we pray, we're going to go into one of my favorite new songs that talks about God redeeming and restoring the ruins of our lives. So many people, so many people's lives are now filled with ruins. But Jesus can heal those. He can redeem and return those things. So as I pray, why don't you stand with me right now as we go back into worship. And as I pray, you agree with me. You agree with me. Jesus, we're saying that you're the one who returns and restores the ruins. You redeem the ruins in our life, God. You make them what the enemy meant for evil. You're going to make for good. What was torn down, God, you're going to rebuild. And, Lord, we're going to set our eyes on heaven because, Lord, this side of the heaven, you said we are going to have trouble. But, Lord, I say, would you meet the needs? Would you speak into the hearts of those who are fearful, those who are, are hiding, those who are worried, those, are who, those who are enslaved and hungry, God? You are the answer. Let us, invite us into that, God. Let us be a part of it. Restore the ruins, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. I look around and all I see are burning buildings, barren trees. Hopelessness is starting to wreak havoc. Son of man, I know you see the deepest depth unknown to me. Cause you have planted seeds among the ashes. And you rebuild, you restore all that's broken from the ruins you redeem. And you redeem, you return. All that's stolen from your children, yeah, that's what you do. So be still, my anxious heart, all that's gone is never lost. And then you well is here, and he is faithful. Yes, he is. So I won't let my praises stop. I'll sing it from these rubble rocks. Cause I know you are good and you are able.
finished yet we can stand in confidence knowing you're here with us right now you're there in Afghanistan right now you're there in Haiti right now Lord give us a heart to see our God making all things new because we know you are the same today as you've always been and always will be. Let faith arise today in our hearts to ask you, God, to heal our land where there was division. Let there be connection, restoration. Where there was fear and anxiety, let there be hope today. In Jesus' name we ask. seen what you can do, God of wonders, your power has no end, the things you've done before in greater measure, God, you will do again, cause there's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can move all things are possible there's no broken body you can't raise no soul that you can't save all things are possible we believe the darkest night you can light it up
Wake us up. Here we are. Oh, we need you, Lord. So come awaken your people and come awaken this city. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people, come awaken this city. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. the Lord wanted to remind some people in this place today that your voice, it matters to him. Like as a good father, he loves to hear your voice. You are not overseen in him. He does not turn a blind eye. No, he sees you. And so what I want us to do in this next moment is I want us to proclaim that out loud at one as one voice, that he is the God of revival. He's the God of revival over San Antonio, over our nation, over Afghanistan, over the world. And we get to declare that to him, that he is who he says he is. So we're just gonna take a moment and in one voice, I want you to out loud, it may be uncomfortable for you, but God cares about your voice. It matters to him. And so we're gonna pray in one voice that he is who he says he is. 
And so will you just begin with me praying out loud, even if you feel uncomfortable, just let the distractions go away. Fix your eyes on Jesus and let's say out loud, God, you are the God of revival. Yes, God, we know you are who you say you are. And so we ask, Father of all, creator of the universe, would you move like only you can move in the church of Crossbridge, in the city of San Antonio, in Afghanistan, in Haiti, at the border, Lord. No one is unseen in you. Thank you that I am seen in you. And so God of compassion, friend to sinners, would you move like only you can move? We know who you are and we trust that you'll do what you said you'll do, you are still in the business of redeeming it all to you. Thank you, God, that you're still in the business of redeeming it all to you. Thank you for the cross, the place that gives us all of our hope. Jesus, thank you that we can come near because of your blood. You are so faithful. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you can be seated. Can you thank the band for leading us in worship this morning? We love to give honor where honor is due. And my name's Morgan Gallion. I'm the high school coordinator here. And I'm so excited for what God has in store this morning because it is our student ministry Sunday. You might've seen Jackson and Mason in the hosting or many of our student leaders helping greet out um, <laughs> in the foyer today. But we are so excited to share with you guys because God has done a sweet work in our youth ministry this summer. And I want you to know that even if you don't have teenagers, you are a part of what God is doing in our youth ministry because you faithfully give. Many of our students wouldn't have been able to come to camp. We wouldn't have been able to have the summer nights that we have. Many of our students went to the Middle East. All of this is because you are faithful givers. So thank you that you are a part of students experiencing Jesus, and we are just so grateful. There's also gonna be a QR code on the screen that's gonna tell you more about what's happening in Crossbridge in these days. So go ahead and scan that. There's some listed there, but I want you to know we have Navigate tonight, which is our Parents as Disciple Makers event, and we're going to give you tools of what it looks like to practically disciple your children. So child care is full, but there's still room for many adults. So if you would, we would love for you guys to be there tonight, and you can find more information about that online. Well, we have some stories to hear of the summer of God's faithfulness and what he's done. So I'm going to invite some of my friends on the stage. These three are seniors. They are in um, our student leadership group called Student Staff. And I love them very much and am grateful for each of them. And they're just going to share with you guys some stories of how God has moved in their lives this summer. Yeah, so I'm Jaden. Um, so this summer was definitely the most impactful summer of my life by far. Um, it started off with me committing my life to Christ fully. Um, and, and yeah, that was uh, instant freedom from a three-year battle with um, addiction and uh, a lot of different sins. And it was just very freeing. And the beginning of the summer also was great because we had uh, like a retreat and a camp back to back. And so it was like the presence of God was just all over the beginning of the summer. But uh, something I learned was that when I came home, um, I was still pursuing Lord and I was in the Bible every day and I'm seeking him and um, praying every day and all that and trying to further my relationship with him. But obviously when you come back to normal life, it's nothing like camp where, or a retreat where God is, his presence is felt throughout the whole day. And so there were times when I didn't feel God as much and Satan was in my ear every second of the day like, oh, you don't feel God, like he's not working anymore, he's gone, like that was just for camp or maybe he's not even real, stuff like that. And, um, but I knew the Holy Spirit was working in me. Um, I never stopped pursuing, I never stopped seeking, I prayed constantly, I cried out to the Lord multiple times because um, it was tormenting my mind, it was tormenting my heart and um, I found a lot of truth. Um, James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. And I let that truth sink into my mind like I don't wanna base my faith off feelings Feelings change every 20 seconds, but the Lord is a rock. The Lord has never changed. Hebrews 12, eight says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, yeah. I began basing my feelings and truth in the foundation of this universe is Jesus. And I've, I've stopped, like, every time I get, like, feeling down or there's a situation or a circumstance that, like, is bogging me down, 
instead of letting that affect how my faith is, I run to my faith as the rock of that situation. And through that, I mean, I haven't conquered doubt, but um, it has just been a re- like a revival in my life. And uh, I feel so much stronger in the Lord because of that. And I just love how the Lord uses doubt and hardship to strengthen and push your relationship forward. So. Yeah, so this summer I um, just got to experience what community was in our um, youth group. And so um, Emma, Kate, and I got to serve as student interns, um, and we really just focused on the community of who um, we were walking in Jesus. And so that was really cool just to get to see this summer, um, just all of us come around um, each other and rally around each other and see what the Lord was doing in our lives. Yeah, so this summer was really sweet for a lot of reasons. The Lord just like stretched me in ways I didn't think he was going to. Um, But doing the student leadership and also um, getting the opportunity to um, go to the Middle East, the Lord just taught me how to like glorify him through it all. But he also taught me how to like walk in boldness. And so in the middle of our trip, we like one day we were just worshiping before we ministered out. And I remember the Lord was like, you're gonna walk in boldness today. And I was like, "Eh, no, I'm good, like, I'll pass. And then three other people, like, prayed over me, and they said the exact same thing, like, you're going to walk in boldness today, and, like, something's really cool going to happen. And I was like, well, that's awkward. I guess something's going to happen. And so I was kind of, like, fighting that, like, the beginning of the day. Um, And then the Lord was like, no, like, I need you to trust me. And so it was really cool to see the Lord's grace through it all and how, Um, Just like walking throughout the whole day, the Lord just like placed people in our path and it was just like a natural conversation with a lot of people. But then at the end of the day, I was like, okay, like you told me to walk in boldness, but I just like, there wasn't like a big story, like nothing like totally happened. And the Lord's like, yes, but like even in your timid yes, like I'm not timid with like my result. And so even through like my hard yes and my timid yes, like he was so um, bold in his um, result of that. So even though I didn't see it then, the Lord showed me how, like, I got to speak um, just, like, the name of Jesus over those people and got to call them by name and pray over them in the name of Jesus. And so it was really cool just to be a tiny part of what the Lord was doing in the Middle East and what he was doing in a place. Awesome. Well, can you thank these guys for sharing their stories with us. They're the best. There are many students that have stories from this summer. And so if you see a teenager in the room, stop them and ask them what God did this summer because everyone has a story to tell of just God's faithfulness. Well, this is my friend, Josh. Josh is a middle school student in a blaze and Josh went to camp with us. So Josh, tell us a little bit how camp was. So um, I was believing lies about God um, before camp, like during the start of summer and Camp really, sh- he like, his presence was so strong there. I couldn't like resist it at all. And I, I got baptized at camp and, um, and Jesus really stayed a new chapter in my life. A walk with him that, that's just so strong. Yeah, that's awesome, Josh. Sweet, well Josh is gonna share some scripture with us that Chris is gonna be um, teaching on today. It's Matthew five and it says, you're the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So I just wanna pray on that. Dear Jesus, I thank you for the summer and, and what you did in these middle schoolers and high schoolers. And just fill this room with your presence and and your word as Chris speaks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Well, this is uh, my 16th or 17th uh, student ministry Sunday, and it feels really good, actually, to not know the exact number uh, because, you know, God has just been so faithful to me uh, and to my family. I'm so grateful to get to be a part of this church family that values uh, teenagers being not only getting to do things, but being a part of uh, the front and center things that happen uh, in our gatherings and uh, in terms of the body of Christ. And that speaks value to a teenager. And so I want to say thank you um, on their behalf. I'm, I'm just so grateful to our student 
ministry uh, leadership team, uh, Drew, Morgan, Lindsay, uh, Kelsey, Joe, uh, the 20 plus adult leaders that we have. Some of you might need to come join us on Wednesday nights. We have a great time. And, uh, and there were so many that gave, their li- gave away their lives faithfully for the glory of God this summer. We had 200 plus uh, at camp. We got to take um, a 10 plus uh, 15 to 18 year olds um, to, to the Middle East with us. I'm gonna share a little bit with you about that. Um, and then just God's been good to us on, on Wednesday nights. I mean, it, this place is electric. And so I just wanna say thank you to that. And thank you to Pastor Kirk for letting me share uh, this morning and uh, for, for letting us do things like this where students get to show you and tell you about what God's doing uh, in their lives. Well, like Josh uh, read, we're in Matthew chapter five. If you have your Bibles, you can bring it or you can open it to uh, Matthew five, verse, uh, chapter five, verse 13. Um, and we're in the middle of this series, or in the end of this series, excuse me, uh, Jesus the Storyteller. Uh, we've been looking and coming around the parables all summer, and this morning, this morning, our time together is not specifically a parable, but it is uh, an example of Jesus as this storyteller, this master storyteller, because he's giving us a word picture, and if you didn't catch it as... Um, Josh was sharing it with us. Uh, He tells us that we're the salt of the world, and so we've got some salt this morning. He tells us that we are a city on a hill, and I had a rough week. The Amazon guy didn't deliver the right thing, uh, so we've got a uh, a Lego guy on um, something, or I don't even know what that is, and he tells us that we are uh, the light of the world, specifically with the word picture of a lamp, uh, and no one uh, that's smart puts a basket get over a lamp when they're trying to light a house. And in these word pictures, there are three things that I believe Jesus wants to speak to you this morning. And he wants to speak them to you about your identity and about your purpose. Because you see, there's a level of obedience for all people who call themselves followers of Jesus, lovers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. There's a level of obedience that flows from our identity. And there's a level of obedience that flows from our purpose. And in the chaotic nature of all that's happening in this world that sucks our identity, that sucks our purpose, and just, you know, just tries to distract us, uh, Jesus speaks, even 2,000 years ago, into all that chaos, and he's gonna speak something to you this morning. And I know that specifically because look at verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. It's something that he is declaring over you. You are the salt of the earth. And in that word picture of calling you that, Jesus wants to speak value over your life. You are a valuable commodity in the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. You are a valuable commodity in the kingdom of God. And I just wanna be honest with you, I struggled even using that word commodity, but I actually felt drawn to it because you know commodities, they have different values. Gold, it, 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 its value increases and people hold on to it. There are other commodities that like basic goods that we use them and then we discard them. And in thinking about that as we process being the salt of the earth and letting that um, impact our identity and empower us in our purpose, um, it's important for us to understand uh, some things about the people Jesus was speaking this to, right? We like, is that a compliment, Chris, that I'm the salt of the earth? It sits on my table. I like to use it, but I don't understand how that brings real meaning and understanding to my identity. Well, when Jesus spoke this to this group of people in that day, salt was valuable. It was scarce. It was expensive. It was a commodity that was to be treasured. Actually, people who got to sit near the salt shaker, they outranked most of the the rest of the people in the room. So next time I invite you over to my house, I wanna see some people fighting to sit next to the salt shaker. But you see, it's in this word picture that we begin to understand some things about our identity and about our purpose. And you see, a lot of us forfeit forfeit valuable things. We give them away for meaningless things every day because we value visibility over actual availability. We, we struggle to let the word of God empower us for purpose in life because we don't understand what God actually values. 
And so Jesus gives us a word picture. He speaks to you today. He says, you are the salt of the earth so that you might understand your own value, that you might understand that you, you can be used by God, that God has a plan for your life, that he speaks to you, he declares things that, that shape your identity and empower you for a greater purpose on this earth. And it's anchored in this idea that God created, um, God created us to, to live for his glory and to be used by him for his glory and to speak things to other people for his glory. You are um, a valuable commodity in the kingdom of God. And the point is, is that Jesus is talking to you. He's talking to you. He's talking to you, right? Get on board with me. There's a lot of yous in this room. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, then you are the salt of the earth. If you call yourself a Christian, if you place your faith and trust in Jesus, you need to understand that a part of your purpose is to be the salt of the earth. And the last time I checked, there's a lot of yous in this room there's a lot of yous joining us online right now. And we, we need to daily remember that King Jesus is the one talking to us. King Jesus speaks over you. You're the salt of the earth. And you see, I think one of the most powerful, powerful things is that he just says it. You, you are. Understand that, that declaration so, so that you can um, let, let it... Um, yeah, let, it, let, you, let you understand the, the father heart of God to bring value to what you get to do on a daily basis. You know, like you heard, we got to go to the Middle East this summer. I was on the second team, and um, we were headed, uh, getting off the plane in the airport, and I got to have uh, my very first uh, conversation, or what I thought was gonna be this really cool conversation with somebody. It was an unexpected conversation. I'd been to this particular country before. I'd read about it. We prepared our team for it. Uh, so many people uh, work in the service industry in this country. They're immigrants. Um, they're, they're really used as a commodity, if you, if you will, um, and so their lives are miserable. They work 12 to 14 hours a day, and um, it's just really hard to, to minister in that setting because people are working so much, and then when they get a few hours off, obviously, they don't really want, you know, want to meet with somebody to do a Bible study, and so uh, I, as we're coming off the plane, we're excited about the ministry, um, and I... Um, I get pulled out of the customs line uh, and I get to have an unexpected conversation with a security guard. And you know, I, I was, um I was a little taken back uh, because as we're having this conversation, I asked him, hey, do you like your job? And I was surprised when he said no because I would have thought that, you know, he's not a taxi cab driver. He's not having to work outside in the heat as a construction worker. I would have thought he would have valued his job, but I was surprised when he said no. And before I go any further, I, I need to tell you a little bit more about the background of this unexpected story. Like I said, I was pulled out for this screening because this guy thought I was famous. He literally thought I was, uh, a, a, you know, someone that he knew from a TV show that he watched regularly, and so I get to enter this, um, this, this these four different screenings where they take everything out of my bags, um, and they're looking through and they're asking me questions about certain things uh, that I have. And at the set, at the at the third screening is when this guy asks me, "Hey, are you so and so?" And I'm like, "No, I'm not that guy." I'm like, really, this is what this is all about. My team, is got, is they're, they're waiting for me. This is an hour and a half delay because you guys think I'm this guy. And apparently they didn't believe me because the very next thing that comes out of his mouth is, hey man, can I take a picture with you? I'm like, I guess, sure. And so then I can move into this other office and uh, my level of annoyance has risen to maybe around seven or eight, but this is the very beginning of a mission trip. So I think, you know what, I guess I'll try. I'll try to engage and have a conversation with this guy uh, about Jesus. This must be what God is doing in this moment. And spoiler alert, it doesn't, it's just, this story is not gonna go the direction um, that you think it's gonna go because this guy hates his job. And and I guess uh, once he found out that I wasn't famous and once he found out that I didn't really have a lot of valuables in my bag, he just, he just, he just lets me go. And I wonder if there are a couple of guys uh, on their Instagram feeds that have a picture of me with maybe hashtag dis disappointed because uh, they figured out I'm, I'm not that guy. Um, 
And I was thinking about that this week because um, I think one of the things we need to understand is most of our opportunities to be the salt of the earth, they're probably gonna have, they're probably gonna happen in conversations that we didn't wanna have in the first place. They're probably gonna happen when we start to, or when we begin to see people differently. They're probably gonna be hap- happen when we understand the pain and the misery that other people are going through. They're probably gonna be happen when we're, we're, we're willing to be inconvenienced or even embarrassed. And, and you see, what happened to me at that airport when I said yes in that moment, I, I remember to this day as we're flying home, and I'm just actually thinking about that. Wow, I guess that's a cool story. I know that I'll, I'll enjoy telling that to people. But I remember you know, the Holy Spirit just kind of sitting down next to me, and he said, you know, Chris, your yes um, fueled the rest of your trip. Okay, and what I, what I need you to understand is that when you listen to the voice of Jesus and when you obey him and when you follow him and when you let him speak a declaration that, that, and you begin to understand it as your identity, it empowers your purpose. And that's when you can expect the Holy Spirit to show up. That's when you can begin to understand that, that the way you give your life away, you'll be purchasing things that can't be destroyed in this lives, in, the, in this world that moths can't destroy, rust can't corrupt, and thieves can't break in and steal. It happens when you understand that Jesus is speaking to you about your identity. You are the salt of the earth. But that, that second picture is this. Jesus says that you're a city on a hill. And that's easy enough for us to understand. We, we took history classes. They tell us in those history classes that the cities on the hills were to be favored, right? They're easier to defend. They, they won't get flooded during the tsunami. And so they built their elaborate cities on the hill, the famous cities on the hill. And so we, we think, wow, that's a compliment, right? Jesus, um, Jesus is saying to these people, you're a city on the hill because you're, this, you're, 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 you're my righteousness and you're shining throughout the, uh, throughout the world for people to see. And that, that sounds like really good. But would it surprise you if I told you that, that the people that heard that they probably would have responded back to Jesus, no, I'm not, right? Because comparison enters the equation and they begin to think, there's no way I could be a city on the hill. I'm just a shepherd. I'm a tax collector. I'm a fisherman. I'm a prostitute. I'm lame. I'm blind. I'm a a beggar. And you see, one of the things that the enemy uses to to distract you from your purpose and to cut to the core of the identity that Jesus speaks over you is he uses shame and comparison. They're some of his greatest tools. And you see, our cities may have changed, but the enemy's plans haven't. And even 2,000 years later in different cities, a lot of us are still falling, falling victim to the same father of lies, Satan's same old tricks. You see, you see, we've got to understand that we may give a lot of money today, but, but God doesn't need our help. God doesn't need our money. He fed people with manna that, fall, that fell from heaven. Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Pastor Kirk has been teaching us for the last couple of weeks. God owns everything. He doesn't need our help. And if we begin to t- attach our identity to the things we do rather than the things Jesus speaks, we will, we will we'll enter into this forever, never-ending cycle of trying to work really hard to earn God's love. But Jesus speaks a word that shapes your identity, that fuels your purpose, and we miss it when we let the enemy convince us that our past failures define us, that that when we let him come knock on the door and scream at us, you don't, you don't have what it takes And I think this morning, one of the things that God wants you to understand about your identity is that you are a city on a hill. See, Jesus already said it about you, right? I love that. It's plain and simple in the text. You are a city on the hill. It's not conditional. It's not like you have to earn it. It's not like you you on your own can become it. He already said it about you. So when the enemy comes knocking on your door, you say back to him, no, I, I am a city on a hill. And he'll follow that by, hey, do you remember what you did? Do you remember what you did as a teenager? Do you remember what you did last week? Do you remember what you, how, 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 what the, the, the thoughts that you had about your boss? And you need to say, yeah, I, I need to repent, but I, I am a city on a hill. It's a thing that Jesus declares over you. It's a part of your identity and it fuels your obedience. And we need to embrace that Jesus is talking about us. 
You see, I grew my beard out to go to the Middle East a couple of months before I thought that uh, I was just spending some time with Jesus and I'm like, I'm convinced this is what he wants me to do. Um, and so for about three or four months, I grew this beard. And uh, I, I was just really thinking, I'm gonna have this amazing story to come back and tell you guys uh, that somebody's just gonna walk up to me and say, man, I, I had a dream about a guy uh, in a green Baylor shirt and a big puffy beard and uh, I saw you and, and it was just gonna be this amazing thing. I really, I really was, was I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not ashamed. I was asking the Lord for that to happen and believing that would happen. And I, I, I walked the streets of this city for several days and no one, not a single person asked me about my beard. And then I thought, you know, um, maybe I keep passing this barber shop. Maybe that's the way God wants to use it. And so I thought, you know, on the day before I leave, I'm gonna go to this barber shop and I'm gonna ask this guy to cut my beard. And, you know, it's my last day. Uh, I can get kicked out of the country now. I'll just, I'll just tell him about Jesus. And so I did that. Uh, I, I let him cut my beard and uh, I waited till the end, you know, like, like not in the middle when he's got the razor on my neck. Um, <laughs> I, tell, I start telling him about Jesus, and he's like, you can't do that here. You need to leave. And, and guys, I don't mind telling you, the walk from, from that place to get in this car, uh, I, I've been a Christian all of my life, and the enemy has just beaten me up, and I'm, I, I'm actually mad at God, too. I was like, I believed you. I had so many expectations that I had began to attach to my identity that this is the way that God is going to do it. And on the way back to the hotel, I get a text from a guy that I had already been engaging about a DBS, and he's like, hey, man, I got some guys here. I want you to come meet them, and I want you to meet my family. And I asked the driver if he can take me there, and so we go there, and um, his wife uh, opens the door, and she invites me in, and um, she, she knows I'm a pastor, uh, and she's, she is so ashamed uh, that she doesn't have a meal for me. She had come from an African culture where you're supposed to bless uh, a pastor in that way, and she is literally ashamed, like uh, wants to stand around the corner and not, not make eye contact uh, with me because she keeps just saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't have anything for you to eat. Um, and in that moment, God said, tell, tell her what just happened to you. T tell her how you feel right now, Chris. Tell her about the shame, about, about the, the, the frustration and the struggle. And so I got to share my story with her. You see, I got to be vulnerable with her. And, and you see, uh, in that, in that we, we got to go to the Bible and we got to have a DBS and we got to invite some other people into the room and we got to talk about Jesus, the one who died for our sins and the one who speaks hope to us and the one who speaks, our, speaks, over, us, uh, speaks over our identity, the one who calls us a city on a hill. And you see somebody in the room and somebody online, you need to understand there are things about you that you've been hiding from people. And Jesus says, you're a city on a hill. Why, why are you hiding that? You're a city on a hill. And oh, you might need the power of the Holy Spirit to empower you to be brave enough to share, but why are you hiding it? You're a city on a hill. It's what he declares about you. It's a part of your identity. And it, it empowers you to purpose. There is nothing, there is nothing that Jesus looks at you and says, I need a do-over for you. No, that's a part of your story because you're a city on a hill and I want to use it to glorify my name and all the earth. And so today, we need a church full of people who are willing to be transparent because Jesus is talking to you. You're a city on a hill. And then finally, the third word picture is the lamp. And I think this is the one that makes most sense to us in modern times, right? Because we understand just like they would have that it's pretty ridiculous to put a lamp, to put a basket over a lamp, right? I can just do them all. Because it's never gonna light a house. It's, it's not an effective means to, to be able to read a book or cook a meal or do anything in your house. You see, with the salt of the earth and the city on a hill, we might have needed a little bit of background, but we don't need it with the basket. And you see, nobody that Jesus was speaking to would have thought it was a good idea, and, and I don't think anybody in modern times would think it was a good idea. It's not an effective way to light a house. And I think that's a point I think, I think what Jesus wants to draw to our attention is that we, we have a choice to make. And more specifically, if I could say it plain and simple, we make a choice to do dumb things. 
We make a choice to invest our lives, running after a golf game, running after the approval of people, running after and trying to attach our lives to anything and everything when Jesus has said, no, you're the salt of the earth and you're a city on a hill. We make a choice to put a basket over that. And, and why, why, would I, why would I not want every part of my life to be a part of a good work that gives glory to my Father in heaven? Why would I not want that? Why would I choose to put a basket over it? The truth is, I, I don't know, guys. I don't know why you do it. I don't know why I do it. But we do, right? There are times we make, we make this decision. We, we, we shut out the voice of God. We say, hey, I'm not good enough. I'm gonna believe the lie. There's no way you could use me. I can't be the salt of the earth, or I don't wanna be the salt of the earth, or Jesus, you couldn't make me a city on a hill. We put a basket over it. And that's why Jesus, the master, story, the master storyteller, gives us this picture, because... When I say we make dumb decisions, I, I mean that in love because we need the voice of Jesus daily to speak over us, to remind us of our identity. We need to go to the word daily to hear his voice, to fuel our purpose so that we, we glorify our Father who lives in heaven. And it's so important, it's important for you to recognize that Jesus is speaking to you. There's no qualification here. You... You are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill. You are the salt of the earth. And so when we would walk these malls, we would just try to engage people. And it was our second day, and uh, we, we walked into one of the particular malls, and um, we were walking around praying, and uh, I see this soccer shop, and I decide to go in, and uh, I, I start talking with this guy, and it was an amazing conversation. It's like our second day, best mission trip ever. I've long forgotten the airport. Uh, I've set up a time to do a DBS. I'm, I'm gonna win the award when I get back to the team because I've already got a DBS. Uh, nobody else does. DBS stands for uh, Discovery Bible Study. And I'm just thinking, man, this is awesome. And we had another assignment at a different mall. And, uh, and so Amory and I uh, and some of the students jump into the subway or the metro and it takes us like, two hours to get there. And this is the second day, jet lagged, I'm hot, I'm annoyed, but we go to the mall, uh, the, the teenage team is walking around, prayer walking, engaging people, Amber and I are walking around, we see this exact same soccer store, the, the same name of the place, and I, I decide, uh, or, or Amber said, hey, let's go, let's go check that place out, the other one worked really well, so go see if you can do, work your magic, Chris, go. And so uh, I go in there, um, but man, I, I, I was just, I was kind of spent. Right, it was hot, I was tired, jet lagged. I'd had an amazing conversation, felt like I'd used up all my words. And so Amory begins to engage this guy and I'm just looking at stuff. And um, she, I, I can hear their conversation and I hear, hear some of those things. I hear that phrase, you know, there was a time in my life and uh, I, I hear her start to cry as she gets to know this guy because he's a believer. He's been working 14 hours a day. He's the new father. He hasn't been to church in forever. And um, so I decide I need to be a good husband and walk over um, and put my arm around my wife. And, you know, she squeezes my elbow. Um, and that means it's time for you to talk, right? Um, <laughs> but I, I just, I don't, I, I, I was tired, guys. Um, and she squeezes my elbow again, and so I finally relent. And, you know, I, I'm really thankful for a wife who kept me from doing something dumb, from putting a basket over a light. Because you remember the beard story I told you about? Well, this is that guy. And this is the guy that I got to share with. Um, and you see, I got to, to speak um, I got to speak to him that day and we got to start doing a DBS uh, together and he's the guy that, that texts me the night when I'm at my low point, says, will you come meet my family? And I'm like, oh, there's another one. Uh, don't put a basket over that one. And I go to his house and it's his wife that opens the door. And remember the whole thing where she's embarrassed, doesn't have the meal for me. Um, and I left out the most important part of the story or my favorite part of the story because she looks at me and she said, Chris, well, she didn't, Pastor, you, you have to know that I've been praying for over a year for a man to come, for a man to come and talk to my husband. I know he loves Jesus, but he works so much. 
He's never home to be with the kids. This life is as hard for us. And she told me she'd been watching this video series from an American pastor, uh, you know, and, and she wants so much to tell her husband what to do, but he's been encouraging her to, to, to not talk at her husband, but to pray for her. And so a year ago, she started praying that a man would come, would come and talk to her husband and remind him about Jesus' love for him and to, to, to just start this process. And, and I'm sitting there and we're both weeping and I've, I, I've, I've lost sight of the fact that I grew a beard and nothing happened. Because for over a year, this woman's been praying and I got to be included in that moment. And before our team left, this guy was learning how to do a DBS on his own, sharing his faith with his neighbors and praying for his coworkers. And so Jesus ends the word picture by saying, in the same way, in the same way, you need to count the cost. In the same way, you need to let your light shine before the world. In the same way, you need to understand what your identity is. And so we have to make a choice today, family. Jesus said it, not me. Listen to his voice. You are valuable. You have something to offer. You are something and someone that Jesus wants to put on display, not for your glory, but for his. He said you're a city on the hill because he made you a city on a hill. And so if you call yourself a follower and a lover of Jesus, there, there is purpose that flows from your identity. And there is obedience that flows from your identity. And so you have a choice to make. I was up early this morning and God changed the, di the direction because I think one of the things that confuses us in this life is that some of this is optional, right? Thank you, Jesus, that I'm not going to hell. Thank you, Jesus. I, I don't mind telling you, I pray that now. Thank you, Jesus, that I live in America. We think some of it is optional. And you see, there is obedience that flows from identity. And when we see that clearly in the scriptures, we do it because it's who we are. He said you're the salt of the earth. He said you're a city on a hill. He said don't put a basket over your life. And so there's obedience, family, that flows from that. And it's not optional, if I could say it that way. It's because it's who you are. He, he told you that you're that. And so if you're a follower and a lover of Jesus, if I could say it this plainly, if you were gonna spend $10 at Starbucks this week, then don't spend the $10 and put it in the box. Because if you have extra money to buy coffee, then what believers do, because they're a city on a hill, they're, they're not gonna put a basket over the light because they're the salt of the earth, is they give to meet the needs of other people. It's not optional. You don't have to pray about the $10 gift. But if you got $1,000 in your savings account, and it's earmarked, and it's earmarked for your kid's education, but since Kirk's been talking, your heart's been beating out of your chest. That kind of obedience flows from calling and purpose. And so maybe in just a minute, you need to come and kneel at the rug, and you do, you need to hear God say, give away your kid's education money, right? Do you understand the difference? I ask the kids to shake their heads with me when they're getting it. There's, a, there's obedience that flows from identity. And there's obedience that flows from calling and purpose. One comes because of who you are, and one comes because of what Jesus has said to you. And oftentimes the American church has decided that all obedience is optional. I need to hear God say what, that I needed to give today. No, you didn't. Christians give, followers of Jesus give because they are a city on the hill, because they are the light of the world. And so if you have extra, you need to let God be glorified, your Father who lives in heaven be glorified by giving it away. And you see, there's, there is the idea that we need to understand this morning about repentance in the same manner. Because when we come face to face with truth, repentance is not an optional thing. When I come face to face with a text, when I, when I saw it, he said, Chris, you're the light of the world. And I knew we were gonna give today and I just took my kids to college and I got all these things. I'm like, I, I, I don't have a choice if he calls me the light of the world. If he says he wants to, if he, if he says I am a city on the hill, I need to obey. And so moms and dads, I wanna encourage you. Your kids need to see you model repentance for them. 
We need to learn to kneel. I, I think it's the macro kind of a repentance that I'm thinking about. The Isaiah 6, woe God, woe is me, a man of unclean lips. What would the church in America look like if when we came face to face with truth, we said, woe is me, forgive me God, because you made me a city on a hill. You made me to be the light of the world and I've been putting a basket over it every time I walk by my coworker or my neighbor. Or I don't really want to give up my coffee. Maybe come kneel and ask, and say, God, I, I'm, I need to repent because I, 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 I need help giving up my coffee. So as Brian and the guys lead us, I just want to ask you to come around that, that idea. Have you been categorizing your obedience and saying, in, in, in maybe miscategorizing it and placing certain things under optional. I'm gonna just pray about that one. I was in AutoZone the other day and this girl was crying and I was busy moving my daughter in and I wanted to leave. And I'm like, if, if I don't, what if it's my daughter is next weekend is there? It's not optional, Chris, is what I heard the Lord say. You go pray, you go see if you can take care of her need. And I need, I need you to apply it. I'm not mad, I'm not angry. I need you to hear Jesus call you the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a city on a hill. And you need to ask him how you need to respond this morning. If it's to give, give. If it's to repent, repent. If it's to go, go. But we have to be a church who understands our identity and that there's an obedience that flows from identity. And there's power when we do that. So would you close your eyes? And there may be an opportunity for somebody to come and respond, to let somebody pray for you, to kneel on the rugs and repent. There may be an opportunity for you to ask somebody um, for help. Church, we have to embrace our identity and so Jesus, I thank you that you ripped the veil in two when you, when you died on the cross so that we could be in your presence. And so we could let your words shape our identity and fuel our obedience. So I pray for my church family today, oh God, would we embrace the fact that you call us the salt of the earth. You already called us a city on a hill called us a lot in the world. Would we repent when we put a basket over it? Would you show us how to respond? It's in Jesus' name I pray and believe. Let's stand and respond together. Every decision, 
speaking to you in your life right now but whenever the word of God goes out he, he, he stirs the heart that's listening and you know what he's saying to you and the question is will, will you obey, will I obey remember his, what he lays on our heart is an invitation to know him more closely an invitation to know the God who made you and your yes, your RSVP to that invitation is obedience. Would you obey whatever he's putting on your heart? Just do it. Just say yes this week. You're going to know him more. On your way home today, in the car, I want you to share what was it God was stirring in your heart. You got about 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, who knows, in the car. Would you just share, hey, here's what was stirring in my heart. Share that with one another. Who knows what God's going to do through that. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We say, 
all our life belongs to you. We're from you. you. You made us, you hold us together even. Every molecule, every atom, every every subatomic particle, Lord, you're holding it together by the strength of your will. And we're just saying, yes, we want the best life. We want to know the one who made us. We want to live for the purpose for which you designed us. So we say, you are Lord. And we're so glad to say it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for being here today. We're going to continue wrap up our series on Jesus Storyteller. Next Sunday, I'll be bringing the word. So come on and be there. And as you leave today, would you greet the people around you? That's the way we're going to stay the friendliest church on earth. And if you want to give uh, for the, the nations that we talked about, remember there's a box back there, the Crossbridge app. Uh, it's also another way you can give. Go in peace. And may the God of peace go with you. Wow, that was an awesome worship session and a really great message from our pastor, world famous Christopher Andrew Dillashaw. Uh, thank you so much to him for that great word and also for letting me call him by all three of his names unbeknownst to him. The Art of Parenting is starting September 21st. You can register on our website for great parental insight. And KidZone needs more volunteers, so uh, you can help me uh, wrangle those elementary schoolers as well as the preschoolers and babies. Uh, and you can email liz at crossbridgecommunitychurch.com for more information. We'll see you next week.